So hi, good afternoon. Uh, many things can happen now. It could just go very, very wrong in many, many ways. But before that happens, let's risk it. Uh, I would like to start by thanking uh, Karen, Cornelia, Karina, who's uh, uh, gone now after these intense days. I want to thank you all for staying here at this late hour, at this witch hour that we're just having this talk now. And so I doubly appreciate that you're, you're here. Uh, m my, um, my imposter syndrome is kicking in like big time because it's just like, oh my God, no, they're, they're still here. We have to share something with you. But actually, we've had three days of such an intense level of interactions, of conversations, of enlightenments, of, of opportunities, of, of forward looking and of discussions. I can only celebrate that, and from there I will do whatever I can to enrich that conversation from here, but uh, take what you have already with you. And I would like to start, oh, maybe two things, maybe I have to, um, I can explain the sex machines, it's not what it looks like, uh, <laughs> but I'm going to talk about this at some other point, I'll be happy to talk about it later. Let me talk about geomedia from the outside. The first thing I need to do is ask for permission to change the title. Because when I formulated the title and the abstract, I had this comfortable position in the outside where I saw myself being able to look at the geomedia from the outside. And after these three days, after learning so much, after feeling that I'm changing the conversation in the, the, my presentation at every talk with a, or at every, at every interaction, at every coffee, I think that I need to change it. And I, I want to change it into uh, thinking the futures of geomedia from the middle. And the middle is not only this uncomfortable place where you're just entangled with the conversations that are already happening and thinking about the futures when this is already happening is particularly difficult, but also it has an epistemological uh, principle and a positional principle. And this uh, connects with the work by Deleuze and Guattari when they talk about the middle. Uh, it's not easy to see things from the middle. Rather than looking down on them uh, from above or up at them from below or from left to right or right to left, try it. You'll see that everything changes. And when we're looking at geomedia from the geomedia conversation, it happened something that happened a minute ago in the, in the conversation before in the panel where everybody was discussing and we were trying to figure out what is the landscape for this thing that we call geomedia and how do we try to grasp it and everything moves at the speed. And that's what happens when you're in the middle, but it's also an enriching position from where to look at it. It's a place that involves you and the way you work with it. Today, however, I would like to share with you four main ideas. The first one is that it is really cool to study geomedia and to make maps as tools, and the, but this is not as easy and as straightforward as because, uh, oh sorry, oh god, what I did, oh no, sorry, see, first thing's going wrong now, oh, there you go, there we are, there we are. Apologies, I'm just trying to figure the distances with it. With with so, four things I want to share. It's really cool to study geomedia and to make maps as tools, but geomedia research is conditioned by a set of factors, among others, among many others. I want to highlight two that I'm particularly interested in discussing because they connect with conversations we've been having these days. The first one is the epistemic features of geodata. Geodata is a particular kind of data with a particular accent on it, and it has particular features that I want to look at and share with you. The second thing, I'm going to go faster on that, is the proprietary infrastructures. And by infrastructures, I mean something generic that goes from the softwares to the satellites and, and beyond. So all of that is something I would like to mention because I believe it's not possible to think of the futures if we don't think at the conditions among which this lives. 
The third thing I want to say is that it's not easy to capture connected public spaces. And this is what I try to do. This is my work. My work has been dedicated to the research on communities and communities organizing themselves and communities working together. And there, the complexity of space, the complexity of geographies was the factor that made it difficult and now that made it more interesting. So I'm going to talk about this and then we'll finish by thinking the future of geomedia or avoiding thinking the futures of geomedia and sharing it with you rather than go straight to the prescribing a way of futures here uh, as instead something that needs to be shared, discussed and further explored. So said all this, let me talk about life in space. Again, it is really cool to study geomedia and to make maps as analytical tools. So that's the chapter at this point. Life is a unique experience, and yet we feel the urge to capture the events to the extent of possible and to immortalize the experience. And then we feel the urge to share it. And with this, which this sharing generates a very valuable and sometimes accessible and very meaningful digital footprint. I like particularly the notion of digital footprint because it has this double side. It has the digital side that seems to lift everything from the floor and makes it virtual. And at the same time, it has this notion of footprint that's very handy because it allows you to think of the path walked the place where you've been, the, the, the mark that you've left behind, and the continuity of footprints that build itineraries through which you can also track and understand territories and the ways you've lived them. And this idea of digital footprint, of course, has a lot of connotations. It goes back onto the flaneur and onto the psychogeographies and onto the, the, work, the work by Benjamin coming back to Baudelaire and so forth. But it also has this side, which is an artistic side. This man, uh, located in London, uh, takes his bike and goes around places and draws things with his Strava and his uh, Garmin. And, and he draw this uh, Mr. Movember on the right side, and then he went to Sheffield one day and draw a Yorkshire man, and, and just went to Sheffield to to draw that with his bike around, which is, which is a sweet way of understanding how this geolocative media works. And that's the part that interests me. Actually, it interests me so much that I've been looking into ways of reproducing this in a more sociological, in a more useful, in a more neighborhood-connected way. And we've done it. I've, uh, we started long ago, 2016, with a festival at the streets of Sheffield, that's the Tramlines Festival. We had some students to, to get, to getting tickets and walking around and tracking themselves, and then we collected the tweets and we put them together on the map of the city centre of Sheffield, and we, we found out things. But with the years, this has become a little bit more sophisticated, and now we analyse the, the geographies and the networks of... Uh, at the center, the Shakira's fandom talking to each other and looking into the conversation that they're setting, or this uh, that's moving the, the video is a digital experience that we had in Sheffield last year with, uh, within the festival uh, Being Human, by which we went to cultural communities in Sheffield ask them to take pictures with their phones, to upload the pictures and to uh, upload the itineraries that they were doing also with their phones and with the Strava app and put it all together. And we put it all together on a map and then we shared it back with them so that they could see how this individual process of taking pictures of your neighborhood actually was an opportunity for them to share understandings of the, of the neighborhood through the pictures and through this interactive map that they, could, that they can still go and do. But in the discussion of geomedia, there's also this other map on the, on the left bottom side, which is uh, Nigeria. And these are the news that have been talking about the different locations of Nigeria obtained from a database from a colleague at the University of Sheffield who has a database of online newspapers of 700,000 articles. And what we did was just 
come through those articles and map when did they talk, which ones did they talk about, what part of Nigeria of those 700,000. And then we contrasted this with the geography of the population densities in, in Nigeria. And, and we got this, which is a beautiful map at this point. Of course, there's a paper published somewhere, so you can just go and chase that one. But uh, that, you know, that's also a way of making maps and a discussion whether geomedia fits or doesn't. But before going all futuristic and wishful, I would like to share some theoretical discussions that should help inform the conditions for geomedia to unfold. And this is the bit that I meant when I said the middle bit. Oh, again. Sorry. Oh. There, but here. So, contested geomedia. Geomedia research is conditioned by the epistemic features of geodata and proprietary infrastructures and invisible technologies. The idea of geodata is a complicated one, and it's the one that we tend, as we do with algorithms, we tend to black box them and send them elsewhere and talk about how we see them from the, from the outside, but not looking into how are they made, how are they built, by whom, and under what uh, ethical principles. So that's a little bit what I would like to do here. Uh, all data are becoming geodata, but not all geodata are equal. Spatial data are understood and as any data, quantitative and qualitative, which have a location, spatiality referenced with coordinates, or topology. So we could say a street or a road with a, with a sign mark could be considered a form of geomedia. But I'm not going to talk about this. I'm going to stick by the digital uh, footprint we were talking about and that digital geodata that your phones is collecting about your movements today at every minute. Um, when we think geodata, it comes as a ghostly figure. It's something vague and strange, and, and, and in a way, it's fragmented, it's decontextualized, it's volatile. It's everywhere, it's dispersed and invisible at the same time. Uh, it's loaded, and we take it as something that has some sort of bad intention. It appears like a monster that we're scared of because it's about to rob our privacy. Our, it's got, like tracking us for some activity that we shouldn't be doing. And, and it's, it's uncertain when we try to think about it and, and, and the, the, the cognitive uh, process. It's too technical to be understood. It's too mundane to be relevant. It is too evasive to be regulated. It is too massive to be comfortable, but we need all all of those, and at the same time, it shows, it shouts that we need some theoretical space to start actually cracking that nut and looking into it, and looking into how is this made. And a way of going through this is by talking with or recovering the, the four white duds, sorry, but it's going to be uh, four of them that actually help understand this split between geodata and their meaning, and that space between which the constructions and the connections are socially built and socially developed as values that we tend to not see. So the first one would be Bruno Latour when he talks about uh, the, the event is human and data instead is the silent non-human witness endowed with meaning. And that data talks about it and says these things. So data are not the phenomenon, but we need to keep this in mind because we tend to miss that bit. That, that bit. The second split is the Baltman, Baltman, Baltman that uh, someone mentioned <laughs> earlier, is the frame versus the experience. Data is the mapped order against the messy, ill-constructed, and confused life sp uh, space and here connects with the heterotopia as the space of compensation by which we try to bring them together, but they just don't fit because one is the order and the other one is the mess, and we just try obsessively to build that. But that's a split, and we need to remember that. The third split is the one that has to do with presence and absence. It's similar to what Derrida was writing about when talking about the signature. He said, you sign because basically you're just testifying that you were there, but that you're not there anymore. And that's the signature. That's what it does for us. It substitutes that operation. So geodata does a similar thing. It talks about a past where we were in a specific, in a specific spot. It remains as the signature after we're gone. So in a way, it tracks 
what we've done, where we've been, and we're not there anymore, but the data is still the witness that keeps a uh, uh, reference of it. And the fourth split has to do, sorry, with the distance between production and recognition. And that's Eliseo Verón, the Argentinian semiotician, who talks about these separate spaces between which uh, he calls it the meaning lag. It's like the data that you generate is not necessarily the data that you recover. And they do not, even if you keep it stored in a very safe place, when the data is generated, it might have one meaning, and when the data is recovered, it gets another one. And they are not necessarily continuous. And this changing of the sign in the process is what he told circulation and is something that's very important to remember when we talk about data. All likes are different. And when you get all the likes back, they get a whole different form from the meanings that they had in the beginning when people were posting them, if that makes sense. So all these dislocations... Uh, we feel them. We, we need to build the bridges to basically uh, uh, understand and survive that complexity. And we, we just short-circuit this process. And we do this by filling the gaps with culturally constructed understandings, with ideology, with all those values that we take for granted and that we don't look at. So when we black box algorithms, when we black box data, when we black box geodata, what we're doing is actually skipping this amount of layers of meaning that have been encapsulated there, and we just don't see them. So it's important that we start thinking about this as one of the conditions for geodata, and therefore for geomedia to evolve and to grow. We need to think in those terms, because that is then encapsulated in regulation, for instance, about artificial intelligence in 23, We've had these two big movements in regulation of AI, according to which you know, we're trying to put law around them, we're trying to build it. But all those things go encapsulated without us seeing them. And this happens five years after the GDPR was approved, which is beyond the piece of law that just changes the European landscape. It's one of the most important pedagogic pieces of data awareness that has ever been written. Because at the same time, everybody knows what GDPR means. Everybody knows about their privacy because you have to click in the OKs when you're asked once and again and again. So it's a pedagogical move at the same time as a piece of law. I'll jump faster now. So Geomedia also deals with proprietary infrastructures going from the satellites that are not free, they're owned, to the algorithms that are not free, they're owned, and they're designed by someone. So when you collect data that has been processed throughout these materials, you're actually assuming that the process is clean. But it's necessary that we keep this in mind. So the political economy of the whole data generation of the whole geolocation processes needs to be something to keep at mind, in mind. But also, the notions of agency and transparency that have to do with the cultural production. We've talked about hate speech these days, and there we've been talking about content moderation. And the content moderation as something that happens in between that appears to us as an automatic thing. And, and it's not an automatic thing. It's a human-led process too. And this change into, from an automatic to a, netero, a neteromatic process in which there's human intervention in between, there's also ethical values that need to go in there. There's also discussions about uh, the, the understandings that were fit in there by those working. So the labor conditions there uh, and the notion of citizenship, which is not that you send tweets. It has a little bit more complexity behind it. Uh, the data traffic circuits, the, the work by Anna Helmond in Utrecht has been fantastic to see, it, this, to map these circuits of how your data is being trafficked across the multiple platforms. Uh, the openness of devices, operating systems and programming languages, how much of what you do depends on uh, what uh, software that makes it for you how much of it is something that you actually own, how much of your data needs to go onto Google Hands so that you can make a nice map, and how much of it is worth recognizing this in the process of data collection, data sharing, and privacy. And the skill sets that extend from awareness to operational capacity, basically to, with the point of acting freely, being able to do your thing on your own. 
So these are some of the topics orbiting around the agenda of platform studies and uh, STS, and uh, therefore it's worth keeping them in mind, and semiotics all over the place, so it's worth keeping them in mind when we think about the futures of geomedia, only with this gaze at the technological side. <clears throat> so let me go on. Your, I told you at the beginning, my interest has to do with communities organizing themselves, communities talking to each other, communities working together to organize into uh, some sort of that community that works, community that has a general good principle for them. And it is not easy to capture the public spaces in which those communities grow and develop. And that has been my concern for the last few years and something that Cornelia and I have been exploring. Uh, uh, it's never extended enough, but a while and many times in many ways. And we're still at it. And when you, when you do that, you think about public sphere. And when you think about public sphere, I'm jumping here, leaping, leaping, leaping. Uh, you, you end up in the London of the 1700s, and you see that there was an ecosystem of communities, of, of access to law, of the possibility of these bourgeois men, white, Christian, to, to decide upon some political processes. And they were the ones consuming art, and the ones consuming literature, and the ones also uh, meeting at the pubs, and then discussing about politics, and then connecting all this through a network of uh, locations, agents, mediating platforms, including the different uh, uh, contents, newspapers, theater plays, theater, uh, uh, paintings, and other forms of art, and the devices that were used to do that, similar to something that we could replicate with the due differences from the London of the 1700s. They discussed about topics, and they had a purpose, which was ruling of themselves fairly within the inequalities of their fairly uh, regulating and the acknowledgement of community, which is the thing we, met, we named earlier in the former uh, keynote that was about uh, belonging. And this idea of belonging goes through these same media and these same platforms. So... Following Chantal Mufa, uh, we need a broader notion of public sphere that goes beyond institutionalized politics because defining politics in that narrow sense would miss the political dimension of the social. So we need to think about this idea of public sphere as something more than and opposite Saskia Sassen coming from the geographies of power, coming from the power in and within the geographies, not as uh, not as the stage of power struggles, but also as power in itself. Because space exists in relation to power, not as an a prioristic uh, objective condition, but something that's built also in meaning. And then we go to where we were. We started 25th of September, so this coming Sunday. Sunday? Yes, this coming Sunday. Uh, it will be... 11 years since uh, Cornelia and I found ourselves in front of a screen of a computer looking at, I was nostalgically looking at the protests in Madrid and they were trying to surround the Spanish Congress and they were doing that by mapping themselves at the same time and showing through the maps, interactive maps, where the police were charging, where the communities were, where people could go. 2012. We looked at that, we looked at each other and we're like, there's something here. It's something shiny at the end of that. We really need to look at that space, at that conversation. So it's not the media. It's not the place. It's the conversation we were looking at. We were looking at how this works and how this works across places. So you see below, on the, on the left side, you see the people protesting. Then you see a bit of the map of center of Madrid. And then you see below these lights flashing between Barcelona and Madrid. These are tweets that were sent from one to another, responded in a, in a conversation that was taking place beyond that central spot of Madrid, protesting against the structures. And if you look further into that conversation, you get this cloud, forrible, if you want, of network that shows the topics and the discussions that they were having, who was talking to whom on what. That is a space of conversation that, for me, requires the geomedia 
gap to start exploring and understanding. And still, I still don't know. I'm still not sure what geomedia means, but I know that we want to look at that complexity, at that space, as something that's rich in both sides. And that's why um, I particularly wanted to share this picture. What happens when we multiply this urban material inequality by portable devices and online activity? What happens there? What's that kind of conversation? What space does it occupy? And for me, the space and for me, the place we're trying to look at is between the two fingers, the space that is really not filled, the space that still opens lines of thought. It's a complicated, it's a complex discussion, theoretically still uh, exploring opportunities and at the same time pulling from all the sides to try to bring something together. I think this is amazing and it's super sweet to find that there's this spot of not touching fingers that actually concentrates all the uh, organization. And that's the middle. Spatial media are transforming the production of space and the nature of speciality. And then we try to name it third space, hybrid space, communicative space, code space, DigiPlace, uh, GeoWeb, locative media, spatial media, mobile media, interfaces, environmental evolutionary regimes, and, and so on. And all of those are just efforts to try to bring together one finger and the other and just trying to make the gap and just, just make the knot at once and say, okay, come on, bring him to life. And it is that opportunity that we have now that allows us to start thinking from there the space that opens ahead of us for the discussion about the futures. So, somewhere between challenges and wishes, I have two points there. But who am I to do this? <laughs> Actually, really, really, it's, it's, it's uh, particularly uncomfortable for me to just like to navigate and prescribe any form of future. I did two, webs, two, two, two slides. But please, apologies, they're just not normative. It's just me throwing things at you so that you can answer back, okay? So, I would start with struggles and resistances. Resistances as opportunities. So, geomedia is a complex intellectual ecosystem. And that's one of the opportunities, but also makes it difficult because we need to understand each other and we need to try hard. The second is the methodologies. They are dangerously compromised because of the proprietary infrastructures I mentioned. We're just too dependent on those, and at the same time, we, we, we need them because it's our, our free space. The field of knowledge requires a particularly high level of ethical awareness. We're treating with people's privacy. We're treating with people's location. So care with that. And, and that makes it particularly interesting, and at the same time, something we need to be careful about. It is not yet known enough or acknowledged as a field relevant to society. We're not called into policy making. We're not called into do something for me. We're not called into what are you useful for kind of stuff. And that's something we need to work on. And the other element is we need to join our intellectual neighbors in the resistance, for instance, against algorithmic discrimination and these fights that are already out there and that we just can join somehow. I would add to this things like hacking, things like make your own thing, do it yourself, build onto that as spaces for resistance, challenge, and exploration that are just there. So there comes the dare to dream, do it more. I've seen this these days, so it's not that I'm inventing the wheel here, I'm just telling you, do it more, we need to do it more, and there to do it more. So we need more interdisciplinarity and inclusion. And by that, I, don't, I mean outside the academia, we need to go outside and learn things from people who are not stuck in the academic environment, that know things from their everyday lives, that know things from their expertise. We need conceptual unfolding to open strands of thinking, to open strands of exploration. We need methodological development, integrating digital tools with human interpretation, as we've seen in these days, people using digital methods that then were interpreted and then digital methods again. So it was this, this process, I think it's very, very powerful. And critically challenging. Uh, we need to challenge infrastructures, proprietary environments, ethical leaps, avoid those, and look for any forms of social injustice in the process. And impact. Impacting as applied work, responsive to problems and complexity, inform policy and awareness, change the world. That's what we need to do. And consolidate community, as in 
this community, as in any form of community of people who are somewhat interested in that tiny gap between one finger and the other and trying to figure out how they connect, if at all. So back to the start slide. Summing up, I wanted to share four main ideas with you. It is really cool to study geomedia and making maps as tools. It is a growing field, many options for development, place branding, tourism, cultural activity, mobility studies, migration, globalization, we've seen them. But it is a research with epistemological pitfalls. We need to review its process constantly. So, sorry. Geomedia is conditioned by geodata and infrastructures. Data is disconnected from reality, humanness, mess, permanency, and meaning lab. It is not easy to capture connected public spaces multiplied by mobile devices and online connections, and thinking the futures of geomedia must be shared thing, struggles, resistances, and a wish to collectively explore the futures, not on my own. So thank you. That's it.